So next chapter, first got to have a big discussion on intermolecular forces. So again, we talked about, we talked about ideal gases that you know, ideal gases, we say there's no attractive forces between molecules. It's not true. All molecules are inherently at least a little bit sticky. Turns out all molecules have what we call London dispersion forces. We'll talk about what that really means in a little bit here. But all molecules have them. Some molecules, the polar ones, have dipole-dipole forces. And then there are a special few that also have an even stronger intermolecular force, hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding, the strongest of the intermolecular forces here, dipole-dipole forces, a little bit weaker than that, and London dispersion forces a fair amount weaker than that. So we'll talk about each of these three. Now one thing to note, we call this hydrogen bonding, but again, it's just an intermolecular force. It's not anywhere near as strong as a bond. These are all much weaker than either ionic or covalent bonds. So usually on the order, like even hydrogen bonding, the strongest of these, is usually on the order to 25 to 100 times weaker than an actual ionic or covalent bond. So these are all in a general sense fairly weak, so, but the London dispersion is the weakest of these rather weak forces. Okay, so if we look at these intermolecular forces, we're gonna talk about dipole-dipole first because I'm gonna use that as kind of a reference point to define these two. So if you look at your dipole-dipole forces, so these are for polar molecules. So in the classic example here, and let's say I've got a molecule of HCl. So to talk about intermolecular forces, what is the fact that we're saying intermolecular mean? Yeah, between two separate molecules in this case. And so here I'm gonna draw two HCl molecules. Now, granted, there are some rather large molecules that have you know, hundreds of atoms, and so maybe, they don't necessarily have to even be hundreds, but maybe one part of the molecule reaches around and bends around and maybe interacts with another part of the molecule, and that would be a rare case where something like this might apply. But usually we're talking about two totally separate molecules. Who's more electronegative, hydrogen or chlorine? Chlorine. And so being more electronegative, we might draw something like this. What does that actually mean, though? Well, it means that the shared electrons here are not shared equally. Chlorine is pulling them closer to chlorine, which means they're further from hydrogen. If they were shared equally, there'd be no charge separation, we'd say. But in this case, because chlorine's pulling those shared electrons closer to him, he ends up being just a little bit negative, and hydrogen ends up being just a little bit positive. This is the little Greek letter D. So delta, it means partially in this case. So partial positive, partial negative charge. And the same thing is true about the other molecule. The hydrogen is partially positive and the, hydro and the chlorine, sorry, is partially negative. And so if we look at these two molecules, the chlorine of this molecule looks over at the hydrogen of this molecule and says, hey, you're kind of cute. So, and the weak attractive force between these two molecules is what we refer to as the dipole-dipole force. The permanent dipole of this molecule and the permanent dipole of this molecule cause them to be attracted to each other. Cool, that's dipole-dipole forces. So the more polar the molecule, the stronger the dipole-dipole force. Cool, if we look at hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding is really, for the most part, it's a little more than this, but for the most part, a super duper strong dipole-dipole force. That's what it really is. So, and again, there's really a little more to it, but suffice to say that'll work for this class. And so in this case, the only way you have a super duper dipole-dipole force is if you have one of three bonds in your structure. An OH bond, an, I'm sorry, FH, an OH, or an NH bond as part of your structure. These three bonds are really polar, and it also plays into the fact that hydrogen is really small, but it turns out when you have one of these three really, really polar bonds that you are capable of this new interaction called hydrogen bonding. Now again, there's two problems with this. We call this hydrogen bonding, but is this really a bond we're talking about here? No, it's just an intermolecular force, so I really hate that they called this this. Also, we called it hydrogen bonding. And so students who quite, haven't quite studied as much as they should have just think that, oh, all molecules that have hydrogen must have it. Well, it's not true. Because every single one of these involves hydrogen. That's why they call it that. But notice it's not just enough to have hydrogen. You have to have a hydrogen that's bonded to a fluorine, bonded to an oxygen, or bonded to a nitrogen for this to even be possible. I like to call these the phone elements, F-O-N. Little mnemonic to help you remember it. So if you look at something like water. 
So here, what's the partial charge on an oxygen atom in water? Partially negative, he's the more electronegative atom, so partially negative. And the hydrogens will be partially positive, being the less electronegative atom. And so here, the lone pair on the partially negative oxygen interacts with the partially positive hydrogen on the next molecule over. And this interaction, these partial charges, are so significant in comparison to any other possible dipole-dipole force you might see, they decided, you know what? We've got to call this something else. If you've got these three bonds, the dipole-dipole force that's, that results, if you will, is so much stronger than the normal dipole-dipole force. Let's just give it a separate name. And again, truth be told, there's a little more to it than just it's a super-duper dipole-dipole force. But that's kind of the way we're going to look at it for this class. And so here, this interaction is what we call hydrogen bonding. So in this case, oxygen here has two hydrogens. It can interact with two water molecules over here. And it's got two lone pairs, so it can interact with the hydrogens of two other water molecules here as well. And so potentially, every water molecule could interact with four other water molecules. And so this is why like, when you freeze uh, water, it expands. Because each molecule is capable of interacting with so, more, so many more water molecules, it forms this huge three-dimensional lattice, and it actually causes it to spread out, which is really abnormal. We'll find out in the next chapter that most compounds, when they freeze, actually compact a little bit. They get more dense. Water's an exception. And it's a really important exception, as we'll see. So, but this is hydrogen bonding. So if we looked at another compound here, and let's say we looked at Formaldehyde. So anybody know what formaldehyde is commonly used for? Sweet. Preserving dead bodies. I don't want to know why you know that, Brie. But it is used for cadavers, preserving dead bodies. So is formaldehyde capable of hydrogen bonding as a pure liquid? Will these hydrogen bond with each other? Well, is this oxygen partially negative? Yeah, you bet. This oxygen's totally partially negative. Is this hydrogen partially positive? Yeah. Not really, actually. So who's more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon is, but just barely. And so this bond is actually not considered all that polar. And so you've got a partially negative oxygen, but you don't have any partially positive hydrogens for him to interact with. No hydrogen bonding in pure formaldehyde. If you notice, we got an O and we got H's. But do we have actually any OH bonds? No. And so as a pure liquid, no hydrogen bonding goes on, whatever, whatsoever, in formaldehyde. So be careful on how that distinction works. Now, there's a second question they can ask you. If the question is simply, you know, is formaldehyde capable of hydrogen bonding as a pure liquid, then no. Hyd you know, formaldehyde cannot hydrogen bond with another molecule of formaldehyde. However, if we mixed formaldehyde with water, could formalde formaldehyde hydrogen bond with water? Yeah, because here I've got this partially negative oxygen, and water has the partially positive hydrogens for this to work. And in this case, it could. And so there's two types of questions then. Can formaldehyde hydrogen bond with itself as a pure liquid? No, it does not have one of these three bonds. But can it hydrogen bond with something like water that's already supplying the partially positive hydrogens? What would be the minimum requirement for a molecule to be capable of that? In that case, it would just simply be F, O, or N in that case. You don't need the H's anymore because water's supplying those. So to hydrogen bond with water, you just need an F, an O, or an N, and formaldehyde qualified in that case. So those are the two questions. Hydrogen bonding as a pure liquid or hydrogen bonding with something like water? Cool. So last but not least, we got London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces. So London dispersion forces, some people will often refer to these as van der Waals forces. But truth be told, that's kind of a misnomer. But because you'll see it so commonly, even in textbooks, I'll write it out there. You can kind of think of them as a synonym as a result. So London dispersion forces, all molecules have these. We just don't usually talk about them for a lot of molecules. Like water, 
Water has London dispersion forces, and you'd probably never hear anybody even talk about it. They're there, and you should know they're there, because everything has them. All molecules have them, but we'd never talk about it for water. Why not? Yeah, water's got hydrogen bonding. If you got super glue, then who cares about the scotch tape, right? So that's kind of the principle here. Hydrogen bonding is so much stronger than London dispersion that, yeah, they're there. It just doesn't contribute much in comparison to the hydrogen bonding. So we usually don't talk about it. So when would I talk about London dispersion forces then, most commonly? Yeah, if I don't have hydrogen bonding, and if a molecule doesn't have dipole-dipole forces, then this is all they got, so you better talk about it. But even though for water and stuff like that we wouldn't talk about it, you should remember that all molecules have London dispersion forces. So and here's the way this works. Let's say I'm a nonpolar molecule. And let's say Thomas is a nonpolar molecule. Is there any reason in a plus minus sense that there should be any attraction going on here whatsoever? Like kind of in this sense right here. Is there any reason that we should? I'm nonpolar, he's nonpolar. No, you wouldn't think so. However, so if I'm nonpolar, so I might have my electron cloud swirling around me, and at one point in time, maybe that electron cloud is right more in front of me than behind me. And so facing Thomas, I'm just a little bit negative. And so Thomas takes his electron cloud and swirls it around behind him, so that facing me, he's a little bit positive. And all of a sudden, I'm like, dude, Thomas, Dude, you're a great guy. We should hang out sometime, dude. And then my electrons swirl back around to the other side. I'm like, oh, never mind. I don't know what I was thinking. So it's a temporary dipole or a transient dipole. And it's weak because it's temporary. So notice to have dipole-dipole forces, that's a permanent dipole, a molecule that is permanently polar. But here, the lone dispersion forces, just due to the nature of the motion of electrons, is a temporary dipole. And because it's temporary, it's usually pretty weak. Now I say usually pretty weak, because here's the deal. It's usually pretty weak. However, the bigger the electron cloud on a molecule, the bigger this contribution it can make. And so even nonpolar molecules, if they get huge with tons and tons of atoms, these forces can actually get appreciable. OK. So we'll talk about how to compare these in just a sec. So, but we'll talk about why to compare these now. So notice intermolecular forces deals with how sticky a molecule is. And how sticky a molecule is affects some of the bulk properties. It'll affect a molecule's melting point, its boiling point, its vapor pressure, so its viscosity, its surface tension, so, and things like the heat of vaporization and stuff like this. They're all affected by the degree of intermolecular forces that that particular compound has. So when you go to boil a liquid, in the liquid phase, the molecules are all touching each other. But when you boil it, it turns it into a gas. And the molecules are now separated by huge amounts of empty space. So to go from a liquid to a gas, if in the liquid they're touching and in the gas they're not, then any stickiness has to be broken to get it into the gas phase. And if molecules are stickier, if they have higher intermolecular forces, then it's going to take more heat, more energy, to separate them, and a higher boiling point is the result. And so in this case, the way this actually works, so if you have higher intermolecular forces, this leads to a higher melting point in general, a higher boiling point. And we'll more commonly in this class talk about boiling points than melting points. So you'll have a higher surface tension. So you'll have a higher viscosity. So, but the one thing that'll be lower is you'll have a lower, in fact, let's write that in another color for emphasis. you'll have a lower vapor pressure. And so now I can give you a bunch of different molecules and ask you which of the molecules has the highest of any one of these properties or the lowest of any one of these properties. And it's based on what types and how much total intermolecular forces it has. So if we explain these for a second. So we just explained higher boiling point corresponding to higher intermolecular forces. I want to explain vapor pressure now as why is the one that goes down. What is vapor pressure? 
So what's vapor pressure? Yeah, it's the pressure of a vapor typically associated with a corresponding liquid. So like if you look at like, <clears throat> if you look at like a lake, there's actually humidity in the air above a lake, right? And the pressure of water vapor in that air above the lake would be the vapor pressure of water. It's the gas pressure, the vapor pressure above that particular whatever. And here's the way this works. Again, when a, a gas, I'm sorry, when a liquid evaporates into the gas phase, in the liquid phase, the molecules are touching. When it evaporates to form a little vapor above that liquid, it's got to overcome any stickiness to get up there into the gas phase, into the vapor phase. And if the molecules were really, really sticky, what would you expect about the number of molecules that would escape into the vapor phase? You'd have a lot less, and they would have a lot lower overall vapor pressure in that case. And so that's why that's the one that's lower for stickier molecules, molecules with higher intermolecular forces. What's surface tension? What's that? Well, it's not how big. So anybody ever seen a water bug? So why can a water bug walk on water? It's light and because water has surface tension. So if you look at like, if we actually kind of zoomed in and was able to look at the surface of water, surface tension is also the reason it beads up on a glass and you can fill a glass fuller than it actually goes, right? It kind of hills up at the top. The molecules, the water molecules at the surface are all attracted to each other and they form this big net where they're all kind of attracted to each other. The water bug is light enough that when he steps on it, he's not heavy enough to break the water molecules apart. Now you or I, we're kind of fat, right, in comparison. And when I step into water, the water molecules just pull right apart. So there's not enough surface tension for me to walk on the water, right, but the water bug can. But that's the surface tension. If we look at viscosity, what's viscosity? So kind of how thick it is. And technically, viscosity is, you know, how resistant a particular fluid is to flow. So when you think of something very viscous, what do you think of? You think of thickness. What? Syrup, honey, molasses. Anyone remember this old, 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 and you guys might not be old enough to remember Heinz 57 ketchup commercials, where the guy, like, you know, pours, turns the bottle sideways on the edge of the building and then runs all the way down the stairs with his burger and then waits and catches the ketchup and stuff like that. But anything that pours thickly, if you will, is very viscous because all the molecules are attracted. When you pour it, all the molecules are stuck to each other and want to flow together like in honey or something like that. And so stickier molecules are more viscous. So that kind of explains why these trends are mostly, you know, higher intellect forces, they're higher, but the vape pressure is the one that's lower. Okay, so let's see how these questions might actually come out. Okay. If I gave you these four compounds, and I said, which of these four has the highest boiling point? Highest boiling point. So you might say H2O. It turns out H2O is only second highest. It's not the CH4 either. CH4, if you draw the structure out, it's nonpolar. Being nonpolar, what's the only kind of force he has? One dispersion. What about argon? Just a single atom and it's totally nonpolar as well and only has London dispersion as well. What kind of compound is NaCl? It's ionic. And all of these are weaker than what? Ionic or covalent bonds. When you have an ionic crystal like NaCl, when you melt it or boil it, you actually have to break ionic bonds. Anybody ever try to melt or boil salt? Good luck, when you melt salt, so sometimes salt gets melted in the earth. And when it does, it usually flows down a mountain. And we call it what? Molten lava, that's right. Super high temperatures to melt ionic compounds. So when you're actually ranking boiling points or anything for that matter, well, if it's ionic, okay, it wins. So, or if it's one of the couple of network covalent compounds you might have learned. Anybody remember the network covalent compounds? They're Covalent, only nonmetals, but they form crystals. Diamonds and quartz, SiO2. Those two would also be at the top of the list. But after that, if you don't have diamond, quartz, or any ionic compound, that's when you start going by these. So in this case, okay, NaCl would have won. NaCl has the highest boiling point out of these four. Okay, now let's take and make this question. Same question, highest boiling point. <clears throat> 
Which one of these has the highest boiling point? Now it's the water. Why is it the water? No ionic compounds, no network covalent compounds. Water's got hydrogen bonding. CH4 and argon, the only thing they have is lunar dispersion. Water wins. Strongest intermolecular forces, highest boiling point. So if you look at these compounds, so keeping in mind that it goes oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, going down group six of the periodic table. So in comparing these, are they polar or nonpolar? First of all, they all look like water, by the way. Just instead of an O, they have an S or an SE or a TE. They're all polar. They're all bent in their molecular geometry. So they're all polar. And so they all have dipole-dipole forces, but are they capable of hydrogen bonding? No, not at all in this case. So they have dipole-dipole forces, but they also have lunar dispersion. Here's the deal. When you're comparing amongst these three forces, if something's got hydrogen bonding and other things don't, the hydrogen bonding almost always wins. But here's the problem. If it's just a comparison of dipole-dipole and lunar dispersion, it's a difficult comparison. If they're all very, 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 very similar in size, then the most polar molecule wins. But if they're different in size, the largest molecule usually has enough extra lunar dispersion to even beat a more polar molecule if there's no hydrogen bonding involved whatsoever. Well, that's the case we have here. These three molecules, there's no hydrogen bonding involved. They're all, they're all polar, but which one is the most polar? Ooh, hydrogen's way down here in electronegativity. Which one of these bonds is the most polar with S? S is closest to fluorine to the upper right, right? So fluorine being right here relative on the periodic table. So in this case, this is the most polar compound. He has the strongest dipole-dipole forces. But the question is, that's only going to win if and only if these are all very similar in size. Are atoms similar in size as you go down a group? No, you get another shell of electrons, and another shell of electrons, and another shell of electrons, and they get a lot bigger as you go down. So if they're in the same group here, they're not similar in size. And in this case, the biggest one wins. Who's got the highest boiling point? H2TE here would have the highest boiling point here. And so this is one of those special cases. Even though dipole-dipole in general are stronger, if they're similar in size. But if there are big differences in size, like down a group, the biggest one usually has the highest intermolecular forces due to the larger London forces. Now, we've got to be careful, though. This is assuming there's no hydrogen bonding. What if I would have included, along with H2TE, H2SE, and H2S, what if I would have included H2O on this list? Well, then water would have had hydrogen bonding, and water would have won. OK. So notice this comparison between dipole, dipole, and dispersion assumes that hydrogen bonding is not an option. In this case, it wasn't. But the moment I add water to this list, water would have even beat H2TE. So be careful. So give you the noble gases is exactly as they show up on the periodic table. Helium, neon, argon, krypton going down the periodic table. And my question is here. I'm not going to ask you the highest boiling point now. In this case, I'm going to ask you the highest vapor pressure the highest vapor pressure. If I want the highest vapor pressure, then what do I want out of the intermolecular forces? I want the smallest overall or least amount of intermolecular forces. OK. Which types of intermolecular forces do these have? Do they have hydrogen bonding? Well, definitely not. Dipole-dipole? No, they're all nonpolar. All they got is London. So then which one of these has the least amount of London forces? The smallest one. Which one's the smallest one? Yeah, based on your atomic radius trends, you learned that helium's the smallest. And so in this case, out of these guys, he would have the highest vapor pressure. So I asked you a different question in this case. The other one's all about boiling point, but this one was about the vapor pressure. And the lowest intermolecular forces in this case had the highest vapor pressure. Those are all types of questions you might see.
So and I've given you just about every type of comparison they might ask. I threw in the ionic compound, the oddball, to kind of trick you. So in here, it was about hydrogen bonding. Here, it turns out it's one of those rare cases where London dispersion actually trumped dipole-dipole. So and then here, it was all about only London, and it's all about size. Any questions about intermolecular forces? OK, the one intermolecular force we haven't talked about yet. There's actually a couple, but only one that's really worth mentioning. And that's ion dipole forces. Ion dipole forces. And truth be told, ion dipole forces are comparable in strength to hydrogen bonding. Some are higher than some hydrogen bonds, some are lower than some hydrogen bonds. But they're comparable, at least somewhat comparable. So, and if you look it up in one textbook, some textbooks say hydrogen bonding stronger. Some textbooks say ion dipole stronger. And the truth is, well, sometimes this is stronger and sometimes this is. So I'm not going to give you an absolute answer. But it's not usually a comparison you have to make either. But ion dipole, the reason I didn't talk about it when I talked about all the other intermolecular forces is that an ion dipole force implies that you have an ion and then you have a molecule with a dipole, which means you have to have something ionic mixed with something polar, which means you have to have two substances. It's not possible for one substance to ever have this. So because one substance is not ionic and polar at the same time. And so if you were ever asked to rank, like, make these comparisons of boiling points and melting points, would you ever like, be ranking a mixture in this context? No. And so that's why I didn't put this in here. But you should know what it is, because it could have just definition question come up somewhere along the way. So if you look, at when you put like sodium chloride in water, you get sodium ions and you get chloride ions separated, dissociated in the water. And the sodium ions get surrounded by water molecules, and the chloride ions get surrounded by water molecules. But what you'll find out is that the sodium ions, when they get surrounded by water molecules, it kind of looks like this. What's going on there? Yeah, why is it the oxygens? Because they're more electronegative. Good. Being more electronegative, they have a partial negative charge. And so in this case, the partially negative oxygens are attracted to the sodium ion, which has a positive charge. Cool. The chloride ion also gets surrounded with water molecules. What's going to be different here? Hydrogen. It's going to be the hydrogens. Awesome. And now it's the partially positive hydrogens that'll be interacting with the negatively charged chlorine. Cool. And so the ions are interacting with the dipoles of the polar molecules, hence the name ion dipole force. But notice it's only possible if you have an ion dissolved in some sort of polar solvent. It's typically how we look at it. Any questions on? Actually, I want to talk about one more thing. Like dissolves like. Like dissolves like. So we talked about all these intermolecular forces. We have one more application. So, and that's when is a particular solute soluble in a particular solvent. So, and things like this. So let's see, who shall we pick on? We'll pick on Molly, because you sat in the middle. So Molly's hanging out with all her friends here, hanging out with all her friends. And so, and I'm going to hang out with my friend over here. Boys, girls, you stay over there, you got cooties. So here's the deal. I'm going to pull Molly out and make a hole in between the other girls. And then Thomas, you're going to go sit where Molly was sitting. Not really, but just pretend here for a minute. And they're going to hate you because you're not like them. So, and that's kind of what's going on with like dissolves like. If you're going to dissolve a solute in a solvent, well, the first thing that has to happen is you have to make room. We have to make a hole for this solute to go. And so you guys aren't happy, because let's say you guys are all water molecules. How do you feel about each other? Y'all like each other. You have hydrogen bonding with each other. You love each other. 
And so me and Thomas here, we're alike as well. And we have intermolecular forces with each other as well. And we like each other. And so he has to get separated from me. And you guys have to separate from each other to make room. That's a problem. Neither one of us likes that. And then Thomas has to go in between you. And if you guys being water molecules are all really polar, and us, we're really nonpolar, when I put Thomas in between you all, will you like him and will he like you? No. And so here's the deal. Like dissolves like because when I pull you apart, I have to replace a molecule that interacts with you in very similar ways as a replacement. And so if you're polar, then the only thing that's going to dissolve in you is another polar molecule. If we're nonpolar, then the only thing that we're going to separate and let dissolve in between us is another nonpolar molecule. And so when like dissolves like, it's about polarity. Polar molecules dissolve in polar solvents. Nonpolar molecules dissolve in nonpolar solvents. So if you typically get this at one of two ends of the spectrum. Water is really, 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 really polar, has lots of hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is like the epitome of polarity, before being ionic anyways. And so if I want something to dissolve in water, what am I looking for? Something really polar. Pick the most polar compound, the, the one with the most hydrogen bonding, and so on and so forth. The other end of the spectrum would be like, let's say I gave you C6H14. That's hexane. Typically, car compounds that only have carbon and hydrogen are nonpolar. And so hexane is nonpolar. If I want something to dissolve in hexane, then you'd be pick looking for the molecule that is the most nonpolar. And that's pretty much the two ends of the spectrum. They either give you a really polar solvent or a really nonpolar solvent. And then amongst the answer choices, you have to pick the one that's most either like him or like him. Thomas. So same way we did right there. So if, like for, let's say, most soluble in water, I gave you the answer choices of those three choices, CH3F, CH3CH3, or CH3OH. Which one of those is most polar, most like water? Why the last one? It has hydrogen bonding. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't CH3F have hydrogen bonding? Awesome. No, he doesn't. If you look at CH3F, is CH3F all by itself actually capable of hydrogen bonding? Actually, it's not. With water, it might do a little bit, but not to the degree that CH3OH would. And so as a result, he's not as polar as CH3OH is, and that will then be the most soluble in water. So be careful. There's no, there's F's and there's an F and there's H's, but there's no FH bonds in this molecule. Cool. Which of these three would probably be the most soluble in hexane? CH3CH3. Again, a compound with only carbons and hydrogens is typically completely nonpolar. And C6H14, all carbon hydrogen is also completely nonpolar. In hexane, CH3CH3 would be the most soluble.